Good evening, readers. This is James Stevens with Exploring God's Library. It is uh, portion 25, Command. And we are well into our reading this year, and um, you're more than welcome to join us uh, this spring as we read through God's Library. It's revealed in his library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The discipline of Bible reading is designed to complement your study of the Bible. It's really a necessary component of our daily walk with God along with fellowship at a local church. This is how the Bible reading program works out. It only takes 20 minutes a day if you read straight through the select passages. The scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are composed of... Oh, I don't have my uh, my speaker. Sorry, we'll try that again. Oops. Getting ahead of myself. It's the other side. The other side. Right there. Straight up. Okay, here we go again. Let's do take two. Okay. Uh, good evening, readers. This is James Stevens with Exploring God's Library. And if you're new, you're more than welcome to join us this spring as we read through God's Library as revealed in his library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The discipline of Bible reading is designed to complement your study of the Bible. It's a necessary component of your daily walk with God along with fellowship at a local church. This is how the Bible reading program works out. It only takes 20 minutes a day if you read straight through the select passages. The scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are composed of 39 books widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, the Law, or in Greek as the Pentateuch, the five scrolls. Remember, the Bible used to be scrolls, not uh, books like we have today. Each day we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called a Parsha. And in one year we systematically read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The religious reading calendar that we're using dates back to the 6th century BC. It was established during the 70 year exile of the Jewish community known as the Babylonian captivity. To this day, everyone reads from the same chapters, which makes it easier to discuss the word on a daily basis. And what we've done is we've extended it to the entire scriptures. So we will then sequentially read through an assigned portion from the historic books and major and minor prophets. Additionally, we will read from the wisdom literature, the Psalm of the day, the same seven Psalms on a weekly basis, and then one of the 150 Psalms. And that way we'll cover all 150 Psalms twice in a year. Then we'll read one or two Proverbs, slowing down the pace intentionally so that we might meditate on that passage during the day, applying the biblical idea of line upon line, precept upon precept. So you get it, you know, get it down better. Finally, we each day we read a chapter from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. Most every Tuesday evening, as tonight, or today, this afternoon, we'll review our readings and provide commentary drawn from various suggested resources. We built a, a, library, a commentary library based upon the bibliography of John MacArthur, who's been uh, teaching in the same pulpit for over 53 or 55 years. And if you're not able to make it that time, we'll post a link uh, to uh, our talk on exploringgodslibrary.org. Please hit the subscribe button for additional teaching and resources. And we also have a private channel on Facebook called Exploring God's Library. And you can subscribe to that. It doesn't cost anything. It uh, protects your identity. And, uh, and it's very helpful because there's a lot of extra material we post every week, which is supplementary to the readings. It's said in the Westminster Shorter Catechism that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The Word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us on how we may glorify and enjoy Him. The scriptures principally teach what man is to be believe concerning God 
and what duty God requires of man. And we, we're going to begin with a devotional from, uh, from the Valley of Vision. It's God, the source of all good, because we're looking at just the goodness of God. So bow with me. O Lord God, who inhabits eternity, the heavens declare your glory, the earth your riches, the universe is your temple, your presence fills immensity, yet you have of your pleasure created life and communicated happiness. You have made me what we are and given us what we have. In you we live and move and have our being. Your providence has set the bounds of our habitation and wisely administers all our affairs. You also set all the boundaries in the world. We thank you for your riches to us in Jesus, for the unclouded revelation of him in your word, where we behold his person, his character, his grace, his glory, his humiliation, his sufferings, his death, and his powerful resurrection. Give us to feel in need of his continual Savior, Saviorhood and cry with Job, we are vile, and with Peter we perish. With the publican, be merciful to me, a sinner. So do in us the love of sin. Let us know the need of renovation as well as for forgiveness in order to serve and enjoy you forever. We come to you in the all-prevailing name of Jesus with nothing of my own to plead, no works, no worthiness, no promises. We are often straying, often knowingly opposing your authority, often abusing your goodness. Much of our guilt arises from our own religious privileges, our low estimation of them, our failure to use them to our advantage. But we are not careless of your favor or regardless of your glory. Impress us deeply with a sense of your omnipresence, with your omnipotence and your omniscience, that you're above our path, our ways, our lying down in our end. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, continue to, to speak to us through your Holy Spirit and your word and strengthen us and give us, give us unction to understand your word and help us to persevere. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we turn our attention to this week's Torah portion, command, a question is often asked, well, why do we need the Old Testament? Why are we told, we are told quite clearly in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 13, that all the things which happened in the Old Testament became our examples and happened to them as examples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Walter Kaiser the famous Old Testament scholar said, the most definitive statement from the New Testament on how the Old Testament is to be used and what roles it must play in the life of believers is to be found in 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16-17 in Paul's admonition to his young disciple Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Since Paul had just finished referring to the sacred writings, it's clear that he has the Old Testament writings in mind. Paul urges the church to go to the Old Testament to get her doctrine and her teaching material. When the Apostle Paul arrived in Berea and taught in the synagogues, the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so in Acts 17.11. Remember, the New Testament canon was not yet complete at that time, so the Bereans diligently searched the Old Testament to see if what the Apostle Paul taught was according to the Scriptures. And so we should do this as well. We should use the standard of the Scripture to measure what others may teach us. We don't put our minds on hold as believers, we are called to love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. At the same time, Paul in Timothy 2.2 said, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men 
will be able to teach others also. So we should be teaching what we learn, we should be teaching to the next person. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2, it says, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. Follow the tradition of the apostles and the apostles' doctrine. Today we have the entire corpus or body of scripture, so we hold dearly to them. And also, uh, sometimes we're not following all the things that the councils have taught, but we also we are also looking at them and holding them up against scripture. In the following Old Testament writings, we find scripture foundationally addressing um, many things that um, you know that that uh, you know we should look at. Okay, in uh, the first five books in Leviticus, we're looking at uh, six, eight through eight, thirty-six. Gordon Winham, in his New International Commentary on the Old Testament Commentary in the Book of Leviticus, writes: Though blood sacrifice have been made obsolete under the New Covenant by Christ's death, those who lead the worship of the New Israel of God may still find that doesn't mean that that uh, the Church replaces Israel. By the way, I mean. It's neither Jew nor Greek. It's like we're, we're one new man. May find still find guidance as to the correct approach and attitude to adopt in divine service. For it is the same God that we address today. God is the same as yesterday, today, and tomorrow. These laws underline that scrupulous attention to detail and punctilious obedience to God's instructions, which are expected to priest and worshiper alike. Otherwise, the man who offered it will be not, uh, not accepted. We express respect and reverence in ordinary life by conforming to the conventions of etiquette in our society. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28-29 Paul, in rebuking the leaders of the Corinthian church, advises them, to lead worship of the church with order and dignity. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14.33 Some believe that spontaneity and lack of preparation is equated with spirituality. Leviticus 6-7 denies this. Care and attention to detail are indispensable in the conduct of divine worship. Everywhere we read, uh, you know, uh, God through Moses gave him, he set a pattern for worship. And so we're to follow that pattern. God is more important, more distinguished, more worthy of respect than any man. Therefore, we should follow his instructions to the letter if we respect him. The Bible affirms that God directed the course of history in order to create a holy people who knew and did his will. At the heart of God's design was the establishment of a pure system of worship in which God could be honored and praised in a fitting manner, through which human sin could be atoned for. To this end, the tabernacle was erected, so God's presence could become a permanent and living reality in Israel's religious life. In Leviticus 6, 1-7, through 7, the laws about the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying to his neighbor, about what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or about a pledge, or about a robbery, or if he has extorted from his neighbor, or if he has found what was lost and lies concerning it, and swears falsely in any one of these things that a man may do in which he sins, then it shall be, because he has sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore what he has stolen, or the thing which he has extorted, or what was delivered to him for safekeeping." or the lost thing which he found, or all that about which he has sworn falsely. He shall restore its full value, add one-fifth more to it, and give it to whomever it belongs on the day of his trespass offering. doesn't sound like when Jesus was talking to Matthew, the tax collector. So he's returning the things that he has stolen. He's trying to make it right. And um, and I think I mean, that happened with us. I mean, my wife worked for... General Telephone, it was pretty much an example, like a lot, and she worked in the switch room, and a lot of the men had their own their own um, 
tool cases which they had taken home. So we just took all those tools that she had collected and, um, and put them in a box and we took it and we delivered it to General Telephone with a note that we're now Christians and so we believe that we're supposed to you return these things. And, and we did that with other things as well in our life. So trying to be right with God. Um, and he, he shall restore what he has stolen or the thing which he has extorted or what was delivered to him for safekeeping. I mean, we weren't, you know, we weren't being malicious by taking those things. We're just, it had been delivered to us for safekeeping. So we returned them. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord, a ram without blemish from the flock before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any of those things that he may have done in which he trespasses. Of course, um, you know, we don't do that any longer because we don't, we don't uh, sacrifice animals. We've, you know, Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice for our sins. Okay, let's look at Ezra. In We're using Derek Kidner. Now, these things that I'm quoting from, I'm quoting actually from these commentaries, so it's not my opinion. It's you know, men that have you know, dedicated their life to the scriptures, understanding, been chosen, you know, speak Greek and Hebrew or, you know, commentators. And uh, Derek Kidner is doing a commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah. And in that Ezra chapter 7 through 10, he comments on the plumb line of the law and it introduces the scholar priest Ezra. And the scholar priest Ezra, he's really brilliant. He knows, he knows, uh, he knows the scriptures by heart. And uh, some of the common commentators we're using, like on Daniel, they also have memorized all the scriptures in Hebrew. Uh, you know, brilliant men of God. Um, uh, Daniel Feinberg at Biola had memorized the Torah by heart. The remaining two all show the moral disarray with which he countered, uh, this is the Ezra encountered, uh, at Jerusalem and the unsparing countermeasures he applied. Ezra's name stands very high in Jewish tradition, where he came to be regarded as a second Moses. And indeed he was more than any other man who stamped Israel with its lasting character as the people of the book. In a lot of times, you know, the Christians are known by Muslims and others as people of the book. What was the secret of Ezra's lasting influence? He was a model reformer in that what he taught he had at first and what he lived he first made sure of in the scriptures. He lived what he believed. With study, conduct, and teaching put deliberately in this right order, each of these was first was able to function properly at its best. Study was saved from unreality, conduct from uncertainty, and teaching from insincerity and shallowness. Ezra also was called to set up a judicial system with full powers of punishment to see that people were not left in ignorance of the law. You've heard the, you know, the thing, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, this is very, very much so. It, even, the, even the king, Artaxerxes, in a letter to Ezra said, you know, if they don't know the law, teach them the law. People need to know the law of their God. And, uh, and you know, then, then the law is enforced. Ezra knew the structure of his society well enough to direct his appeal to the heads of families. Thirteen years before the events of this chapter, um, and then, then Ezra disappears from the biblical, biblical record. So, so you're going to, during, what's really amazing about the scriptures, you're reading letters, your private correspondence, from the kings of this world. These kings were brilliant kings. They didn't even become kings or uh, rulers of empires, you know, by a whim. They they're brilliant kings. And so we're reading like letters from Artaxerxes. You were reading a you know a, the Cyrus cylinder. Uh, I mean you're you're reading things that that uh, verify the scriptures are true. Okay, let's look at New Testament. Um, Acts uh, 24 through 28. We're coming to the end of the uh, Acts. Although the Sanhedrin, that's uh, the 70 rulers of, of 
Israel, they're the judges, right? And they're the priests. They had made very serious charges against Paul. They couldn't prove them. Luke stresses, that's the writer of Acts, stresses that Christians are innocent, law-abiding people. The town clerk at Ephesus acknowledged that, as did Galileo, proconsul of Achaia. The frequent allegations by unbelieving Jews that Christians were political revolutionaries were untrue. And this is this keeps going on. So it's not unexpected that we're accused of things that we're not guilty of. Um, I mean, some people are. Uh, you know, they get off into these, you know, these causes which are not you know, biblical causes. But we were we weren't political revolutionaries. Ironically, it was those same Jews, not the Christians, who were who finally rose up in revolt against Rome. It was the Jews, not the Christians. When Rome ultimately did take action against the Christians, it was not because they were revolutionaries. The Romans persecuted and killed them for refusing, on religious grounds, to participate in the empire-unifying ritual of emperor worship. And presently, I'm reading, uh, along with this, my reading, I'm reading the history of uh, Christianity in Japan. And um, the emperors, you know, they were they did not want Christianity in Japan. So you... Um, if you if you read the scriptures, you were subject to execution. So, um, because they really believed in you know emperor worship, you know the Shinto and Shinto emperor. So, uh, and so the Buddhism and Shintoism were really promoted. It took a long time to get through that before you know, missionaries were able to preach the gospel freely. Reading the book of Acts 24 to 20, it's quite, it's quite a thrilling series of trials which Apostle Paul was put through at this stage of his journey. I don't know if you, you know, you're going to read about um, these uh, Jews who took a vow that we're going to kill or assassinate the Apostle Paul. And, um, and they couldn't break that vow and they were, you know, they were, they were committed to killing him. Of course, they didn't uh, because... God sent some people ahead. Um, uh, it was Paul's sister's son, right, hon? Mm -hmm. Paul's sister's son was sent ahead to tell, to warn the, uh, the Romans that there was an assassination attempt being put together against Paul. A very exciting story. And by the way, even in um, the story I was uh, reading about the history of Christianity in Japan, they also... Uh, there were Christians that uh, even moved into the the realm of being um, counselors to the the emperor of Japan, a shogun, and they were one was assassinated because he held to what they called the evil religion. The evil religions included you know, Buddhism and and uh, and Christianity, but a lot of it was based upon the early Jesuits and what they had done. So there's a whole history there. It's a fascinating history. But there was a, they, they had an assassination attempt and they actually killed uh, one of the Christians on the road. And, um, but then they, um, some of them came to Christ and they repented and they, they confessed their sins before others because, because of filial piety, they were, they were, if they were involved in this assassination attempt and, they failed, then they had to take their own life. But one of them said, well, because a Christ, I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to forgive these people. So he did, and, and it opened up a whole, a whole um, time of repentance between these men, and, and you know, they forgave one another. And it's a powerful story. Reading the book of Acts is quite thrilling. In MacArthur's commentary, they actually find the high priest Ananias has come down with elders and an attorney named Tertullius to bring charges to the governor against Paul, calling him a real pest, stirring up dissension among all the Jews and serving as a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Paul defends himself and argues that he was not guilty of creating a riot. In fact, he even shaved his head. He did all these things where he had shaved his head and beard. He had to take a vow to go in and go to the temple with with other believers, and showed that he was not, um, you know, uh, um, not creating dissension. 
he goes on to prove that he followed the law and held to the truth of the resurrection. Because the Sadducees, it says, Sadducee, the Sadducees, Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. But the Pharisees, um, a sect of uh, the Levites, um, they, um, they believe in the resurrection. And so Paul is defending the belief in the resurrection and the truth. So, uh, very interesting, it's, it's Felix and it's Agrippa and, and um, Fest, is it Festus too? Mm-hmm. And Festus, so there's, it was Festus, Felix, and Agrippa, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like these different leaders and they're, you know, sometimes they just want money and sometimes they, they're just fascinated by this, this um, man. I mean, because Paul is very well educated and you'll see it when you read through the scriptures Something that's very difficult to understand, yet to you know study the study the doctrines that he's he's preaching, but he's quite brilliant. So we're wrapping up, and you know we're seeing Paul. You know he goes to the shipwreck. He's on Malta, and that's exciting too. You know the whole thing, and you know, and what his interaction with the crew of the ship was. You'll enjoy that, and Psalms. Um, 126 and 132 is the, the Psalms of Ascension. So we come to the completion of the group of the Ascension Psalms. 134, as the Jewish pilgrims reach the temple to worship the Lord, um, the resurrection day is risen. Um, and Psalm 135, really interesting. And I've used this many times because I used to be an idolater. I had Elizabeth and I had an idol. We worshiped idols. Isn't that strange? People actually in America can re- worship idols. A Christian nation. Well, is it a Christian nation? It's a whole debate. Uh, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. And we actually, when we got rid of our idols. We had um, uh, um, our friend Archie Akazawa, his fam- family had been making uh, idols for over, I think, 500 years? About 500 years. So, I mean, it's in the family, passed on. So everyone that makes them is like them. And w- what are they like? They, they can't speak. They're dumb. They can't see. They have no... They have ears, but they can't hear. They need to be boistered up, you know, with a stick, you know, make sure that they don't totter and fall. And, um, you know, even at uh, the Thai temple in in, in um, the Sun Valley where Grace Community Church is, um, you know, when they had the, they have the giants, you know, guard in the front door. And um, and when earthquake comes, you know, they fell. I mean, they're, they're, they're just dumb. They have... Their work of men's hands. Um, psalm 136 is really interesting. It's a psalm for people in battle. Can you get me Psalm 136 then? Yeah. Um, according to Spurgeon's Treasury of David, which we use for interpreting the Psalms, when the time of the Emperor Constantinus, oh, in the time of the Emperor Constantinus, Athanasius was assaulted by night in his church in Alexandria by Cyrenius and his troops, and many were wounded and murdered. The bishop of Alexandria sat still in his chair and ordered the deacon to begin the psalm, and the people answered in prompt alternation, for his mercy endures forever. That's the confidence they have in God. And you also see that the Ezra had that too. Ezra had you know, beseeched the king you know, for you know, help, and... Um, and the king gave him money, and he gave him, um, thank you, he gave him money, and he gave him permission to go back to Jerusalem. And, uh, and then he, he really felt like he couldn't really, like, um, he asked the king for troops to protect him. He says, I trust in God. So do you really trust him? And he's asking himself, do I really trust in God that much that I have to ask the king? So they, he, he, um, he prayed and and he trusted in God and the the rob the robbery 
They could have been robbed on the way because they had a lot of money and uh, they didn't have a, a troop escort. But actually, um, they arrived back to Jerusalem without any incident. And then they went through all the, you know, they took an accounting of all the monies that were gave, given and it was to the, to the penny, basically. Uh, I'm going to read the psalm because I think sometimes we, you know, we read commentaries, but also, you know, when we read the psalms, we start to really understand. I was reading the commentary, and I, some of it was interesting, but some of it just it didn't hit me at the time. It doesn't mean that every time you know you're going to be hit by something, and you know, but you know you learn. But here's the Psalm 136. It's thanksgiving to God for His enduring mercy. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. For him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. And we're coming to a season where we have, we have um, uh, lunar eclipses, solar eclipses. And in history, sometimes people really fear, feared those things. In fact, it happened in Japan. I was reading about the history of Christianity in Japan. And one of the things that that they explained is what, you know, the God who controls the heavens and the earth. And and so they were able to use this one um, sighting of a comet. And I forgot the name of the comet at the time. But uh, they used that to just explain uh, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show forth his handiwork. So they were able to you know, use, I mean, Christian scientists have explained these things for a long time. So, um, continuing. Uh, to him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, and his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. And we're about to go into um, Passover, right Elizabeth? couple weeks from now. So, to him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, and brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever, with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever, to him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his mercy endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever, but overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever. To him who leads his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, you know, the giants, for his mercy endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his mercy endures forever, a heritage to Israel, his servant, for his mercy endures forever, who remembered us in our lowly state, for his mercy endures forever, and rescued us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever, who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. And that means forever. I mean, and even the problems that they're having in the Middle East now, with um, uh, Lebanon and and Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran, for His mercy endures forever. This is, you know, this this whole battle is not over yet. 
Okay, um, looking at Proverbs. Um, better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife, right? Dwelling in the tents of the wicked, you don't, you don't need that. Just being quiet. Um, Proverbs seventeen sixteen. Thinking about uh, right now, we just went through April Fool's Day, uh, you know, American holiday. I don't know if it happens in other countries. But um, in seventeen sixteen it says, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he has no heart to it? And uh, using uh, Charles Bridges' commentary, he says, A young man will spend income at the university in the professed purchase of wisdom, and yet idle away all his time. I, we've seen that. You know, I'm sure I had to wait a lot of my time at the university, you know, but um, a thoughtless rake, uh, which is an old English term, and it means a desolute, de desolute or immoral person, especially a man who indulges in vices or lacks sexual restraint, might be warmed even, warned even by his worldly friends. He is losing important opportunities, revolting his best friends, involving himself in debt, injuring his constitution, blasting his character, is not this throwing away a valuable price by reckless folly? I mean, these are examples of folly. It seems the following are examples of this folly. The town where Jesus was brought up, you know, in Galilee, the cities where he wrought his miracles, they, you know, he... Uh, they couldn't do many miracles in this town because of their unbelief. Willfully despise the price of wisdom. The Gadarenes threw away the pearl. Uh, Herod eyed it with curiosity. People would just play with it. They have money. They have power. But they're just, they're just curious. They're not serious. Pilate with indifference. The Jews with scorn. The rich youth preferred his own goodly pearls to it. You know, people that had, had money and and kind of, you know, they preferred their own riches. Felix hoped to turn it to his own selfish purpose when he was he was interviewing Jesus. He was hoping that they they're going to like uh, give him some kind of a bribe to let him go. So they were waiting for money. Agrippa dared not purchase it. That was the king that find up ended up doing it. And these these. Uh, People like Agrippa really understood the Jewish law. They had studied it. In fact, the the books, um, the history by Josephus, who was Jewish, um, a lot of people in Europe were reading a uh, reading about the Jews because it, it was a history and and they understood the customs. Um, Agrippa dared not purchase it. Were not all these pictures of the fool? that every day meets our eye. We run into fools all the time, right? So you don't cast your pearls before swine. Which is more, um, that which is more precious than rubies is more sweet than honey. It becomes as tasteless as the white of an egg. People just living for themselves as if there is no God in this world. It's really terrible. And that's a study, you know, it's a study of humanity, right? I mean, because you're, I mean, that's anthropology. Um, the doctrine of the week we're going to look at, um, goodness of God. Um, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. In the Reformed Study Bible, uh, R.C. Sproul, he comments on the doctrines as they appear in the Bible, which is what we're, do we're doing. It. We're following his lead. James declares... Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. James 1.17 God never changes. With him there is no shadow of turning. This suggests not only that God is immaterial and therefore incapable of casting a shadow, but also that there is no shadow side in a figurative or moral sense, not like, uh, you know, like La Force, you know, the dark side. Um, to God shadows um, to God shadows suggest darkness in the spirit terms darkness suggests evil since there is no evil in God there is no hint of darkness in him there is no darkness in him he is a father of lights 
when James, James adds that there is no variation or shadow of turning with God, is it not enough to understand this merely in terms of God's unchanging or immutable being? This reference is also to God's character. Not only is God altogether good, he is consistently good. God doesn't know how to be anything but good. So closely linked to goodness, to God, that even pagan philosophers such as Plato equated ultimate goodness, the highest good with God himself. The goodness refers to both to his character and his behavior. His actions proceed from and flow out of his being. He acts according to what, is, what he is. Just as a corrupt tree cannot bear incorrupt fruit, neither can an incorrupt God produce corrupt fruit. I mean, his fruit is good. Behold the God, he is good. The law of God reflects his goodness. God is said to be good not because he obeys some cosmic law outside of himself that judges him or because God so defines goodness that he can act in a lawless manner and by the sheer power of his authority declare his actions good. God's goodness is neither arbitrary nor capricious. God does obey a law, but the law he obeys is a law of his own character. He always acts according to his own character. Wow, that's an amazing thought. He always acts according to his own character, which is eternally, immutably, that means unchangeable, uh, like pure gold, and intrinsically good. James teaches that every good and perfect gift comes from God. He is not only the ultimate standard of goodness, he is the source of all goodness. This is really looking at anthropology, too. I mean, or just looking at man. One of the most popular New Testament verses in Romans 8.28, and we memorize this, and, if, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. This text on divine providence is as difficult to comprehend as it is popular. If God is able to make everything that happens to us work together for our good, then ultimately everything that happens to us is good. We must be careful to stress here the word ultimately. One, one the earthly, on the earthly plane, um, on the earthly plane, things that happen to us may end, may indeed be evil. We must be careful not to call good or evil or evil good. I mean, don't call evil good and good evil. We encounter affliction, misery, injustice, and a host of other evils. Yet God in his goodness transcends all these things and works them out to our good for the Christian. Ultimately, there are no tragedies. Ultimately, the providence of God works all these proximate evils for our final benefit. And that takes a lot of faith. You think about, um, you know, Joseph and how he sold into slavery by his brothers and, you know, taken, uh, taken by force. And, uh, but um, though, though man meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Um, the marker of the week is anthropology. And it's really where we're looking at Psalm 139. Um, you know, it's, it's talking about David is asking the question, Search me, O God, see if there be any wicked way in me. It's looking at the heart of man. You know, in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart of man is deceitful beyond all things. Who can understand it? Um, this, uh, this is from Michael. C. Bear's book on Bible doctrines for day is recommended to us by Kathleen Pearl, a missionary in Muslims. She says the clearest and simplest book on doctrine she has found. Use it for teaching your kids. The word anthropology is derived from two Greek words, anthrops, meaning man, and logos, meaning word or doctrine. Hence, anthropology is the doctrine of man. The study of anthropology covers the subjects 
of the origin of man, his fall, and the results of his fall. The biblical doctrine of anthropology is a study of man from a biblical perspective. True anthropology must begin and end with the word of God. Biblical anthropology teaches two main facts. Man was created by God in his image, right? And man is a sinner by nature. These two facts are in opposition to the teachings of modern non-Christian anthropologists. They usually base their studies of man and his culture on two unscriptural premises. One, that man has evolved from the animal's evolution and that man is basically good. And if you're a parent, you know that's not true. And if you face your own life. Okay, we're going to um, move ahead. Looking at the biblical and historical figure, John Fox. Um, I didn't do much here, but uh, you can find it online. Fox's Book of the Martyrs and Const Constantine the Great. Elizabeth, maybe we can uh, put a link up for that. So we'll put a link up for you. Um, I think there's some good audio playlists, and if you don't have the, if you don't have uh, Fox's Book of the Martyrs, it's well worth reading. Um, the early church really cut their teeth on that because it really talks about people who really gave their life for Christ, and it looks at you know men like Tyndale, Wycliffe, a uh, whole bunch of people. Um, the resurrection predicted a prophecy in the Old Testament. Um, Job nineteen twenty through twenty seven, and New Testament John five twenty four through twenty nine. And we're going to look at the hymn of the week. Rejoice the Lord is King. It's by Charles Wesley. I love this. It says, um, "Rejoice the Lord is King. Your Lord and King adore." Mortals give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say rejoice. Um, this is a little bit of the background on which I really appreciate. Hymnologist J. Richard Watson summarizes Rejoice the Lord is King. He says it's an economical statement of the final triumph of Jesus as Savior and Judge, as stated in the Apostles' Creed. The opening stanza of this well-known hymn by Charles Wesley, written back in the 1700s. Um, the opening stanza of this well-known hymn by Charles Wesley is one of unbridled exuberance. The six-line stanza contains at least seven imperative exhortations. Rejoice, give thanks, sing, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, Rejoice again, I say rejoice. That's so good. And sometimes, you know, we have to speak to ourselves this, this way. You know, we get depressed about us, you know, simple things, you know, like, you know, um, bills or sickness or things like that. We have to, we have to speak to our soul, just like, um, just like the psalmist. Psalmist, uh, King David, he said, uh, you know, he's telling me, be still my soul. He's, he's, um, he said, why, oh my soul, are you so disheartened within me? So sometimes we have to really do some self-talk, I mean, from scripture. Um, this hymn was first published in Hymns for Our Lord's Resurrection in London in 1746, in time for Easter that year. This small focused collection of 16 hymns was one of pocket-sized volumes on seasons of the Christian's year produced by Charles during the mid-1740s. I like that. Pocket-sized volumes. Uh, you know, I've heard that uh, that the Welsh really love singing and that during certain revivals that you could go down the street and you'd hear hymns from every single house. What would that be like? Well, they had to have little pocket him pocket size volumes and that's great rejoices is the only hymn from the collection was continued in use interestingly the collection does not include charles wesley's most famous easter hymn christ the lord is risen today an unusual feature of this wesley hymn is this refrain in lines 5 and 6 
in five of the six stanzas. This refrain begins with a citation from the 3rd century Eucharistic invitation. Lift up your lift up your hearts or sursum corda in Latin. Wesley adapts sursum corda to the singular heart to the fit the context of the hymn, heart and voice. Agree as singular nouns the that voice may rhyme with rejoice. The author changed it to hearts for the 1772 edition of this collection only. An unmistakable reference to Philippians 4.4 follows these exhortations in the final line, Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. As is typical in Wesley's hymns, this one is rich in biblical allusions. In addition to the reference to the Sursum Corda stanza, I, one begins with an allusion to Psalm 97. The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Lines 3 and 4 of stanza 2 partially quote Hebrews. It's so full of scripture. Hebrews 1, 3. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wesley's lines 4 and 5 in stanza 3. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. <coughs> We're inspired by Revelation <coughs> 118. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of health, hell and death. Hymnals, hymnals today generally include four of the original six, six-line stanzas. Hymnal editors often omit stanza four. The omission is regrettable because it is a lyrical summary of Article 6 of the Apostles' Creed. See, this is, this is how we got our creeds. Our creeds are declarations from the Word of God. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Almighty. Lines 4 and 5 may be drawn, draw upon the kenosis hymn, Philippians 2, 5-11, through 11, specifically, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. He sits at God's right hand till all his foes submit and bow to his command and fall beneath his feet. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice. Rejoice again, I say, rejoice. The exclusion of stanza five is understandable, according to British Wesley scholar J. Richard Watson. It is characteristic of Wesley's enthusiasm, his pride in the achievements of Christ. That's wonderful. Figured in the image of the swelling bosom. He all his foes shall quell, shall all our sins destroy, and every bosom swell with pure seraphic joy. That's the joy of angels. Lift up your heart. Lift up your voice. Rejoice again, I say, rejoice. The final stanza begins with an eschatological reference. This is in time. Rejoice in glorious hope. Jesus, the judge, shall come. These lines draw upon the final verse of Psalm 96. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Psalm 96.13 Wesley's reference to the judgment echoes the Nicene Creed. See, their creeds are showing up. From thence we shall come to judge the quick and dead. The stanza concludes with a reference to 1 Thessalonians 4.16-17, leading to a triumphal modification of the final refrain. We soon shall hear thy archangel's voice. The trump of God shall, shall sound. Rejoice. Like Christ the Lord is risen today, John Wesley admitted rejoice the Lord is king in his monumental collection. Um, the mission led to an, this hymn being overlooked in the United States until it was included in the Wesleyan Association collection in 1849, and not in the British Wesleyan collection till 1876. Rather than placing it among the Easter hymns, most hymnals include either the Christ of the King or Ascension and Reign selections. I like this. Christ the Lord is risen today. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Earth and heaven in chorus say, ha, ha, hallelujah. 
Raise your joys and triumphs high. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Sing ye have in earth reply. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Love's redeeming work is done. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Fought the fight, the battle won. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Death in vain forbids him rise. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Christ has opened paradise. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Lives again our glorious King. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Where all death is now thy sting. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Once he died our souls to save. Where, ha, ha, hallelujah. Where's thy victory? Boasting grave. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Soar we now where Christ has led. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Following our exalted head. Ha, ha, hallelujah. May like him, like him we rise. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Hail the Lord of earth and heaven. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Praise to thee by both be given. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Thee we greet triumphant now. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Hail the resurrection, resurrection thou. Ha, ha, hallelujah. King of glory, soul of bliss. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Everlasting life is this. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Thee to know, thy power to prove. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Thus to sing and thus to love. Ha, ha, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The all good valley of vision. Let's close with this. My God, you have helped us to see that whatever good be in honor or rejoicing, how good is he who gives who gives them and can withdraw them. That blessedness does not lie so much in receiving good from, from and in you, but in holding forth your glory and virtue. That it is an amazing thing to see deity in a creature, speaking, acting, filing, shining through it, that nothing is good but you, that we are near good when we are near you, that to be like you is a glorious thing, that is our magnet, our attraction. Be with us. You are, you are all my, our good in times of peace, our only support in days of trouble, our one sufficiency when, God, when life shall end. Help us to see how good your will is in all, and that when it crosses mine, teach us to be pleased with it. Grant us to feel you in fire and good in every providence and to see that your many gifts and creatures are but your hands and fingers taking hold of us. Your bottomless fountain of all good, we give ourselves to you out of love for all who we have or own is yours, our goods, our family, our church, ourself, to do with as you will, to honor yourself by us and by all ours. Be it, if it be consistent with your eternal counsels and the purpose of your grace and the great ends of your glory, then bestow upon us the blessings of your comforts. If not, let us resign ourselves to your wise determinations. We want to be like those Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego, that even if God doesn't save them in the fire, they'll still praise you, Lord. 
And we pray that everyone has a good week and had a good week. Um, and help um, help people that are need finances, like um, uh, Chuck Cairo. Please help um, someone come along that will buy all of his equipment so he can get his treatment. And bless also Bishop Kumar in uh, India and all of his needs. And uh, if you can help us, you know, we're always you know, appreciative. And um, we pray that uh, you would you would pray for us. And um, and and if your if your church desires to have you know be in exploring God's library, let us know as well. We can always teach them as well. Bless you and bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen. And this week.